Well, greetings, children of the Most High, our Holy Father. Of course, I'm talking about Almighty God in heaven. This is Philip with another discussion that I hope and I pray will make a lot of you think deeply about something very, very important to all of us. And at the same time, I hope it will bring you a lot of joy, a lot of peace that maybe you're struggling with right now from time to time. But maybe by the time we're done with this, as you think about it, you'll have a greater peace of mind about this subject. A survey was done a while back. By the way, before I start, I, I have moved, and we're in a rental place right now in Florida. And so right now I am doing my best to do a recording. I'm not in my usual area, so hopefully this will be uh, something that, that works. And I hope to have new recordings again on a regular basis, probably a couple times a month going forward, God willing. Anyway, a survey was done a while back, and the question was, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? You know what the number one answer was? What would your answer be? Well, the number one answer was, why, say, addressed to Almighty God, why do you allow so much pain and suffering in the world? In other words, they would ask God, why doesn't he intervene more? Why doesn't he use his power more? Why doesn't he stop injustices? Why, does he, why doesn't he stop the wars, get involved and stop the suffering? Why doesn't he stop the suffering, the tortures that are going on, the, un, the incurable diseases and the suffering, especially the little ones, the innocents, the children? And we'd ask him to especially do more to keep so many children, like I said, and young people, the innocents, from going through all of this. I think all of us could relate to that question. Why doesn't he intervene more? Why is there so much pain and suffering, even in the very family? Sometimes it seems like especially among believers of the very family of Abba, among his very own children, and even the little children. We all know people, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we all know people who are men and women and children of God who are suffering with MS or Alzheimer's. I have some of that going on in my very own family relatives or the results of an accident that wasn't their fault. We know children in pain because of sins and stupid things others did, like a drunk driver or something like that, that hurt these children physically, emotionally, spiritually. I remember a woman in Canada who had her 12-year-old daughter in her arms, dying in her arms from leukemia and severe pain. That was years and years ago. The baby, the, the child did die. Why did God, why did Abba allow that? Um, by Abba, that's the Aramaic for father or dear father, similar to our daddy today. The words Yeshua said in the Garden of Eden, I mean Garden of Gethsemane. Why did the 12-year-old girl get leukemia at all? Why didn't our father just heal her when she did get it? All of these are questions we may be pondering. And you may be wondering about even people within your own family and your own friends and family, within your church or fellowship. My own family and siblings have gone through a lot of pain. Two of my siblings have suffered debilitating strokes. And yet they are strong believers in Jesus Christ. In fact, my brother has a, p a prison ministry, a nursing home ministry. He served in his church a lot. He writes a regular essay in the church paper on Christian values and so on. I have two relatives by marriage who are suffering with dementia. In our very human times, even we plead for healing. And if we admit it, we wonder, why, Father, aren't you taking this away? Why did you allow it? Why aren't you more involved in it than what appears to be? So today's message, we'll be talking about why there's so much pain in the world, even afflicting innocent children. But I want to focus especially on why there's so much pain in the very own family of God among believers. That's the hardest part, I think, for a lot of people to understand. I prayed very, very deeply about this. I hope and pray it will be a blessing to you. I hope God's Spirit will speak to you in your heart as you hear this. And I hope that the message will be one Father wants you to hear. And I pray you'll feel and find peace with this message, no matter what your trials and pains are. You see, you and I reason that if we were Father, now don't get uncomfortable with this, but I'm going to take this to the edge here a little bit. If we were God, the Father, of the spiritual family of God, we, we reason, 
would do something about all of this. We would have more healings than the ones we see. We'd have protected more children than what we see. We reason this way. We'd be more involved. And may I dare say it, in the end, when we wander too hard in that direction, we could even cross the line and start to judge Abba himself, thinking, surely there's something better than what he's doing. And then we wake up and repent of that and realize we best be careful lest we find fault with the potter of all the living clay called humans. Right? But we've gone there, haven't we? In our wondering. But let's get back to a central point. I think we all have to believe, even in our pain, Abba, God, is love. Everything he does, everything he allows, everything he doesn't do and doesn't allow, everything he sends, when we put ourselves in his hands, we must conclude, it is well with my soul. Or like the Shunammite woman who lost her son in Second Kings 4 said, everything is all right. I think she said that three times when she was asked how were things when she was on her way to find Elisha because her son had died. Go back and read that story. What an incredible statement of faith. Is everything okay? Everything is all right, was her answer. It's normal, though. It's human to feel pain, grief, and anguish. Father certainly understands that. Scripture allows us to grieve, but we must come to the point where we grieve in hope, where our anguish In our anguish, we look up, not down. So let's get into this. And yet we all know these issues about why God does what he does, why he seems absent at times, are age-old questions. But Abba is never absent. Never, never, never when it comes to you if you're his child. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought you've ever had and ever will have before you even have them. According to Psalms, I think it's 139. And yet, we all know these issues about why God does what he does just seem to go on and on. He's never absent, though. So I hasten to add, and I know that I know, that Father has involved himself positively in my life and yours, listen now, thousands of times, saving us from disaster, from humiliation, from pain, And we weren't even aware of it. Probably even today, or last night, or this week. But now that I'm 60 years old, I look back at the many stupid things I did when I was younger, and I know, I know Yehovah was being merciful to me. I know He intervened so many times, sparing me severe problems and pain. What I'm trying to say is, in all the time that we think, where are you, God? We must wake up to see He was, in fact, involved in so many, many ways that we didn't even know. So let's start with that. God is love. He knows you. He loves you. Everything he does is for your ultimate goal. Good. We know Romans 8, 28, everything works together for the good for those who are the called, who are the called ones, okay, and working out to his purpose and his good, even when we don't see it yet. But even Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane undergoing severe anguish, had to resign himself in the in the end to the Father's will, even with the impending severe, crushing blows he would have, the excruciating pain he was about to endure. Is it possible, Father, Abba, to not have to drink of this cup, but not my will, but yours be done? We know the famous words. Father did send him an, an encouraging angel, we're told, as Yeshua sweated blood from being in so much agony. He says, I am in agony. I'm in anguish. And we even see our Savior get up after that and get on with the pain. Accept it and know it is well with my soul. All is well, even if I'm going to have to go through severe pain. So even Yeshua was in severe anguish of mind and came through as the victor. He can do it again in you and he can do it again in me. One of the biggest reasons for pain, which I hope we'll have time to discuss more later, is to teach us to keep looking up. Keep looking up and not down in the dirt, but up to the heavens, to our Father and to Yeshua, even in our pain, no matter what, to trust, 
no matter what, no matter the outcome that Father allows, no matter how painful. For he is good. He is love. He is love personified. And as the saying goes, it's all good, even in pain, even in the suffering, even in the severe tests and trials, even in death. If God is in your life, even if you don't understand it, it's all good. That's the bottom line. Now let's prove it. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. If you want to turn there, I'll just read it to you. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in your way forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. Trust in him forever, for in him is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. Might be turning now to Philippians 4. Paul addressed the topic of why God, why, you know, why do you do things that seem so unfair, so uneven to us humans down here? And if you read the whole chapter 9 of Romans, Romans 9, he goes into all of that. I won't go into it now. Basically, his bottom line is, you, know, you guys, you know what? He's the potter. We are the clay. Who are we to question the potter? He can do what he wants. If you believe he is love, don't question him. Accept it. You can question him. Yeshua question him. Is it possible? But then come to the conclusion that Yeshua did, not my will, but yours be done. What does Paul say in Philippians 4, verses 12 to 13? Paul was such a good example of applying what he himself taught of, of, of trusting the potter. In Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13, he's in Philippi, or he's writing to the Philippians, I mean. He's coming to the end of his life. He's been through tremendous suffering and torture and everything. And he says in Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned that in whatever state I'm in, in whatever state I am, to be content. Wow, I'm not there yet. Are you there yet? I'm not there yet, folks. Are you? He says, I know how to be abased. Philippians 4.12 now. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But notice he says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. He's learned to be content, whether free or in shackles, whether full or hungry. He could do all things through Christ. That's where each of us has to come to as well at the end of the sermon. That what Abba allows is fine. The same Paul, remember, was the one who went through trial after trial, pain after pain, he was stoned and left for dead. Imagine being hit on the head so many times by rocks that they finally knock you out and they think they've got you dead and leave you there. Shipwrecks often. Five times, I think it was, he was lashed, 39 lashes. Three times or so, maybe I have that backwards, he, uh, he was beaten mercilessly with rods. I mean, just whipped hard with sticks and rods. And more than what I've just said, and Abba allowed that of his servant. He allowed him to go through all of that. Finally, he ended up being beheaded. And yet Paul teaches us, it's all good. I've learned to be content. It's all good. Wow, brethren. That's where I've got to end up. That's where you've got to end up. So maybe if we take the subject apart, we'll learn the steps to how to get to that point. Of Isaiah 26, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Isaiah 26, 3. And Paul's statement in Philippians 4 that I've learned whatever state I am to be content. Because I can do all of that through Christ who strengthens me. So, these men and women of God, they experienced abandonment by family. Some of you are going through that. Beatings, stonings, torture. They were fired. They were thrown out of their towns. 
They suffered unemployment. They suffered death in the family. And they came through it with peace. There are Christians in many Muslim countries who are being martyred and threatened even now. Even in Egypt, people who proclaim the name of Jesus as Coptics. I'm not a Coptic, but I'm just telling you, would you be willing to go through what they're going through? And now when it's our turn, we need to be like those who've gone before us and crossed the finish line in victory with them through Christ, who strengthens us, who gets us there. Frankly, I realize that won't satisfy most of you just to say it's okay for now. But that is the point where we trust Abba no matter what is happening to us. That's the bottom line. In a sense, that's the whole message. No matter what's happening to us, Father must know we won't waver in our faith being placed squarely in him. So we need to understand that so we don't give up hope when we have our when we have our trial. So my goal is that we will come to faith at the end of this message. I'm not there yet myself. I did this as a study for my own self that I'm sharing with all of you. I've been through a lot of pain and it's caused me to be able to give this sermon from my heart. And as I gave up and gave in to Yeshua and to my Father in heaven, it's amazing how many doors opened for us in just ways that, without me going into my private life, in just ways that obviously showed God's blessing and God's forgiveness and God's allowing us to move on with his blessing. It was very, very moving to us. This sermon is a result of that focus of finally saying, it's all good, Father, whatever you want. I want to give the pain to you. I want to give the suffering to you. And will you please work in our life and bring it to your glory. And may you bless people with it, with the pain that I've been through and my wife and all others. And uh, the sermon is the result of that. So let's get into it. When was the first pain? I want to ask you this question. Can, can Yahweh uh, feel pain? Can Yahweh feel pain? And when would you say that pain was first experienced? When was the first pain that ever, ever happened? Do spirits suffer pain? God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says that. Angels are called ministering spirits. They're spirits. Can a spirit being like God or angels feel pain? I don't think they feel physical pain. I don't think you can jab them with a pin and they'd feel it. At least that's how I understand it. Abba and spirits can't be hurt by jabs or pointy things or fire or knives or bullets. But what about mental anguish? Does Abba feel sorrow in his heart or anguish? Why don't you stop and think about that? You can pause the CD if you want and discuss it for a minute with the group you're in. Does Abba feel anguish, pain? Does he hurt? Some people reason that since God is in perfect control of all things at all times, and he knows what he's doing, and, and therefore there's no pain because he knows what he's doing. I've heard that said. And yet, Scripture is very clear. I know that in the pre-flood time, just before the flood, in looking at the earth, and I'm just about to call Noah, it says that Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man where it says the Lord in all caps in your King James Bibles. I'm going back to the original Hebrew on that, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H. That is his name. He says over and over, you have not heard my sermon on the name of God. What is his name? Please go hear it. Man took the liberty to change his name 7,000 times, almost 7,000 times. In the document that he wrote where he said, don't change a thing here. So we changed his name. Anyway, the Lord is not what Yahweh means. It doesn't sound like it. it. has nothing to do with it. Go back and hear the sermon. Anyway, Genesis 5, 6, 5 and 6. When Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, 
And Yahweh was sorry that he had made man. Is, is there a feeling expressed here? He, he's sorry he had made man or mankind on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. He was, I don't know if God had, God doesn't have a flesh and blood heart, but he has a, he has a, a center of feeling. He was grieved there, it says. Grief is a feeling. Grief is an anguish. So it's clear that Yahweh can be grieved. A quick concordant study will show you many, many instances where Yahweh felt sorrow and anger and other emotions. He was grieved in his heart. It's a strong statement. You can't read the story of the gold calf incident without feeling God's pain. Or the story in Hosea, I think it's chapter 2 and 3, where he says to Hosea, Hosea, go out there and marry a woman you know is unfaithful, so that that will be a, an object lesson, that will be a physical uh, example of the way I feel being married to you, the nation here, as an unfaithful wife who has become unfaithful. I think that says a lot if he's asking Hosea to go marry a woman who would be unfaithful, a whore, basically. So God feels pain. God feels anguish. God feels anger. God has emotions. God is the one who put emotions into us. So when do you think pain was first experienced? Some of you will think, some of you will think that it was in the Garden of Eden when God banished our ancestors, Adam and Eve, because it says in Genesis 3 to the woman, when God is cursing the man and the woman, he talks to her first here, to the woman he said, I will, I, God, not Satan, I, God, will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. And in pain you shall bring forth children. And you'll have a desire for your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and in toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles shall bring forth to you. So again, there's pain, there's sweat, there's sorrow. Uh, but that wasn't the first pain. I believe with all my being that there was pain long before the Garden of Adam and sin. I believe so. I believe pain is the evidence of something or some relationship not being right. It doesn't have to be your fault now. It could be, but it's not necessarily your fault. But pain is the evidence of something or some relationship not being in harmony. When our body parts aren't in harmony, we're sick and in pain. When the spiritual body is not in harmony, and we are parts of his body, there also is pain. That's why we have so many splits among the body of Christ, because we're not in harmony, and the body is sick from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. It says in Isaiah 1, and we are spiritual Israel today. We are spiritual Judah today. When we can't come together as a harmoniously working body, there's something wrong and there's pain going on. So when was the first pain? I believe the first pain was with the first sin. When Halel, that's his name, commonly mistranslated Lucifer, a Latin word, got out of harmony with God and sinned, and he rebelled against Yahweh. And when we... Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. And when we read about Satan's rebellion, in Ezekiel 28, where it talks about the king of Tyre, then goes on to discuss the, the spirit that was behind the king of Tyre, and in there it says, you were in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, verses 11 to 19. Ezekiel 28, verses 11 to 19. You read that on your own, and it talks about him being in the Garden of Eden, and you were the anointed cherub in verse 14, Ezekiel 28, 14, who covers and I establish you, you were perfect in all your ways, verse 15, until iniquity was found in you. That entire passage about Lucifer's rebellion and sin is called a lamentation. Great Yahweh in the highest is saying, I made you perfect, I gave you all of these things. And you let sin come into your life. And he is lamenting. He's feeling. A lamentation is when you feel grief. Sin angers God. Sin also grieves God. 
He has no delight in the wicked that they should die. It says that in the book of Ezekiel. So yes, our Heavenly Father himself feels pain. Disappointment, grief, sorrow, anger, and much more. If there's any doubt about that, all you have to do is read the book of Judges and see how sometimes he got angry and would send plague, drought, famine, disasters, captivity, conquerors, and so on. So sin angers him, but it also saddens him. And we also know that Yahweh, Yahweh made flesh, that is Yeshua, that he felt pain. God, as a man, felt pain. Okay? And the Word, whom we know was God and is God, in John 1.1, 1, 1, became flesh, John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. Yeshua was God in the flesh. John 1, 14 says so. Otherwise, it would have been a sin for him to have forgiven sin. Otherwise, it would have been a sin for him to have had people bow down to him because we're only to bow down to Almighty God. But he did allow both. He was God, okay? And he felt the dismay and the pain of being rejected by his own. He was thought of by the Jews around him to be a bastard, frankly. John 8, 41. He, and they said, we're not born of fornication. Like, the implication was like you were. Our father is Abraham. We weren't born, I don't know who your father is. Basically what they were saying to him in John 8, 41, you, you know, you, it wasn't Joseph. So how do you think that felt? He wept over Jerusalem and said how often he would have gathered them under his wings like a mother hen, but you would not. To me that explains and, and, and is discussing pain. That's in Matthew 23, 37. I would have brought you under my wings like a mother uh, uh, hen does her chicks, but you would not. And it says he grieved, he wept over Jerusalem. He certainly felt the severe pain of the scourging and the crucifixion, the physical pain. And now he understands pain as one who has gone through it. So when we pray to him and ask him to help us in our pain, to carry it, to, to uh, be able to go through it, to be healed of it, he understands what it feels like to go through pain, rejection, physical and mental anguish. Okay? So let's establish that, that when we pray to an almighty God, the Father or to God, Yeshua, that God understands pain. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. So let's go into some other points now. Why is there so much pain in the world? I want to cover this first point rather quickly because I want to focus on the pain among the children of God. But why is there so much pain in the world? I won't spend a lot of time on it, but it must be said Yahweh, the one true God, has decided he wants to spend, he wants to be surrounded by beings and people who have free choice, free moral agency. They can decide for themselves to do good or bad. He doesn't want robots. He doesn't want to push a robot in the belly and it says, I love you, you know, that kind of thing, or it does things that are programmed to do. He wants us thinking and doing because our heart is that way. I don't see how living and thinking being can have free moral agency, the ability to make our own decisions and choices, and therefore our own mistakes and the, and, the, and the consequences of those stupid mistakes, without also having pain. As long as there's free moral agency and the ability to sin, the ability to, to bump our head, as, as it were, like children bumping their head on the bottom of a table or, or stepping off the edge of a pool and drowning because somebody wasn't watching them, as long as that ability is there to have consequences of our free choice, there will be pain and there will be suffering. This is a huge explanation for so much of the pain that we see. So many times the one who is suffering pain, in fact, is going through that pain because of someone else's actions and decisions in this world. Almighty God has decided to allow that. So we can all learn that there are consequences when you do certain things that will affect you and your loved ones and maybe your entire nation. I know a friend who died of severe prostate cancer because he was in Vietnam and got sprayed with that Agent Orange, as many thousands of soldiers were. That wasn't his fault that he died of prostate cancer. It was a decision 
that the God of this world working through our governments made to spray a defoliant, I think it was a defoliant, Agent Orange. And then one man's sin, Adam, Adam's sin affected all of us. By that one man, sin entered the world, and we all got kicked out of the garden through Adam and Eve. This is very clear in Romans 5. Romans 5, verses 12 to 14 and 7 to 19, 17 to 19. By the way, you and I, I don't think, would have done any better. Yes, one man, one person, including you, including me, can have a tremendous impact, positive or negative, for generations to come. So my point is, decisions by others, decisions by the government, decisions by us, decisions for war, for, by, by drunk drivers, sins of passion that result in unplanned pregnancies and problems, affect innocence. Sometimes babies were born with deformities because of poisons in the food. They didn't do that. It wasn't their fault. Thousands were born without arms and legs, the thalidomide babies of the 1960s. That wasn't the baby's fault, probably not even the mother's fault. The kingdom of God won't be established on earth until the millennium. Right now, it's the kingdom of Satan. He was the one who offered Christ. Remember, all these kingdoms I will give you if you'll bow down to me, because they were his to give. Yeshua didn't argue that point. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So God basically has had a largely a hands-off policy in the day-to-day affairs of this world because he's not working with everybody yet. He's, he's calling a few that he's working with right now. But right now, since we are in Satan's world, we also bear the consequences or have to live with the consequences of a world that's not God's world. That doesn't explain everything but it explains a lot of it. So sin abounds. Satan's way abounds. And what we reap is pain. The world is sowing sin, sowing Satan's way, and they're reaping the results of that. And so in Romans 8, Romans 8, verses 19 to 22, it says that the whole creation is groaning, can't wait for their liberation from Satan's way. Romans 8, verses 19 to 22 The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. If you haven't heard my three sermons in January, February, March of 2013 about your breathtaking destiny, I hope you'll hear it. A most incredible and important series. You must hear it. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected him in in hope. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together even until now. So in this world, we will suffer, and we will, hey, aging happens. We all get old eventually. We do start to get old. We do start to lose our eyesight. I'm beginning to lose my good eyes, my hearing, and things like that. I'm only 60. Isaac was blind in his old age. David couldn't stay warm in his old age. Paul was unhealed with his thorn in the flesh. Elisha, whom God used to heal so many, himself died of an illness, and on and on and on. We're actually promised trouble and tribulation. And if we go back to our ancestors ahead of us, uh, who died ahead of us in Hebrews 11, write this down and maybe follow along with me quickly. Hebrews 11, at the end of the book, Hebrews 11, 32 to 40. In, in, In the faith chapter and talking about all these great men and women of faith, it says, what shall I say then? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Remember that phrase. So we'll come to that later. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. Hebrews 11.35, I'm in now. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So enduring the pain helps test us and prove us so we can end up in a better resurrection. Others had trials of mockings, scourgings, chains, imprisonment. Have any of you hearing my voice today? Been imprisoned for your faith? Or scourged for your faith? Or been on trial for your faith? 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They think that was Isaiah. They were tempted, slain with a sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. Have any of us gone through that? We will if we're not taken to a place of safety or protected during the Great Tribulation. We'll talk about the rapture sometime. But when Christ comes for his saints, Matthew 24 is very clear that he comes for his saints after the tribulation of those times, of those days. Matthew 24 says that. But anyway, there's some rough times coming ahead. Of whom the world was not worthy. Hebrews 11:38. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and so on. All of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive their promises. God having made something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. We're all going to have to go through it. My point in reading that last bit is no matter how much pain and suffering we are going through, we have not gone through the same degree of suffering and pain that those did ahead of us. And maybe we better get used to it because I don't think it's going to get any easier but there are reasons for the pain, and ultimately it's to help us to help God to see that we trust him no matter what. In fact, another point here, God's children have been promised pain and suffering in this life. Don't be deceived by these health and wealth ministries. They're simply out there to make themselves wealthy, I think. That's not what's promised in this life. What did Yeshua say? John 16:33 In the world he said well he starts with John 16:33 these things John 16:33 these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have trouble tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world he says in this world you're going to have trouble Yeshua said that Paul said in Acts 14.22, I think to the elders in Ephesus, Acts 14.22, he's getting ready to leave there. Acts 14.22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, he was exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, here it is, Acts 14.22, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. We must, through a lot of trouble. He says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12, that's not only going to be trouble and tribulation, but persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Many of them were martyrs. And actually the very word martyr in the Greek, martyrios, means witness means witness. Isn't that incredible? The word was synonymous. If you were a, a, a witness, you got killed. In the meantime, there's Satan out there broadcasting his thoughts, if we will listen to him. Oh, God's forsaken you. Where's your father in all of this? He could have stopped it. Just come on over to the dark side. <laughs> you know, Tokyo Rose in World War II would broadcast these to the GIs and New Guinea and uh, the islands that they were island hopping at the time. Oh, give up, you know. Your president doesn't care about you, but we will take care of you. Tokyo Rose. Satan does the same thing. So Peter says that we have to endure suffering. First Peter 5 verse 9 and 10, that all these sufferings are experienced by everybody else in the world. Now, I want to ask you, who ultimately sends the pain? Is it Satan? Or is it God? This might be hard for some of you, what I'm about to say. Whether God sends it, he certainly has the power to not allow it, but he does allow it, doesn't he? So who ultimately is doing it? Remember what he said to Adam and Eve? I will greatly increase your sorrow, and in pain you will conceive. 
to Job, who was the one who caused the problems for Job? We know Satan was the instrument who did all the all those hard things. But look at Job 42. Turn in your own Bible. I'll wait for you. Grab your Bible. Job 42, the Old Testament, before the book of Psalms. Job 42, verses 10 and 11. Yahweh restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. We'll talk about that sometime. That so many blessings could be coming our way if we pray more for other people and forgive those who have hurt us. Indeed, Yahweh gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job 42, 11. Then all his brothers and sisters came around to comfort him, it says, and console him. Now listen to the end of verse 11. For all the adversity, Job 42, 11. For all the adversity that Yahweh had brought upon him. For all the adversity that Yahweh had brought upon him. That Yahweh, that the Lord, it says in your English, it should be Yahweh, had brought upon him. Who did it? It's right there, isn't it? And then in the story of Joseph, at the end there where Jacob dies, they're all now in Egypt, and Joseph had gone through tremendous suffering at the hands of his brothers, caused by his brothers. Eventually, he's elevated to become the second most powerful in all Egypt. And you know the story, then when Jacob dies, be turning to Genesis 50. Genesis 50, as I introduce this. Genesis 50, 5 zero. Jacob dies, and now Joseph's brothers are all scared to death that he's going to take vengeance on them and punish them for their meanness to him. And uh, he's, he's told about that, that they hope you'll be merciful and all that. And then in Genesis 50, verses 19 to 21, Joseph said to, the, to his brothers, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Oh, you meant evil for me. I, I know that. Job 50, verse 20. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as of this day to save many people alive. God saw what you were doing, but he allowed it to save not just our family alive, but humanity. This was a seven-year severe famine and drought. So who caused it? Certainly God allowed it, I'll, if you allow me that much at least. Gets no clearer than that. God saw it all along, and God meant it for good. Now, that clarity didn't come to Joseph for many, many years. I mean, he was in pain and suffering for at least 13 years. And then the years it took to get Jacob and the family to come down, and then the years before Jacob finally died. And now, years and years later, Joseph is being able to say, now I understand in some cases, though, we might not even see how God worked it out for good until long after we're dead and in the resurrection look back. Did Abraham ever see his children as the sands of the sea? No, he didn't. But he'll see it later. Okay, so that point there is just that God is the one who's very involved, especially when it comes to the lives of those he's working with, which is really my focus in this sermon. Sometimes, I want to cover this point quickly too, sometimes pain is for our chastisement or, or, or chastening. Sometimes we goofed up and need a spanking. In Revelation 3, verses 17 to 19. Revelation 3, verses 17 to 19. Here's another reason for pain, even among the children of God. When we do something wrong, if we're God's children, he will say, hey, I told you not to do that. You're going to have to get a spanking for that. So you stop. And so you come when I say come. So you sit when I say sit. And you don't go where I say not to go and so on. In Revelation 3, verses 17 to 19, it says there to the Laodiceans, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He says, I want you to go through the fire and be like gold refined in the fire. And I'm rebuking you. I'm chastening you. Therefore, be zealous and repent because I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. One of the most meaningful Father's Day cards I got was when one of my kids wrote to me and on a card that, Dad, I know that you love me 
because of all the things that you have done to to watch over me and correct me. I know you did it in love because you cared. David said in Psalm 119.71, Psalm 119.71, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. In Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 8, Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 8, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Scourges every son he receives. He spanks. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you've all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You know, I would never spank the neighbor's kids. They're not my, they're not my kids. He's saying if you're not receiving pain, you're not the child of God. He says, you all, you're all receiving pain, and therefore, since we're human and we make mistakes, there is some spanking going on. God's trying to get our attention. So when our father sees us going astray, doing something stupid, or about to, he may inflict some pain and suffering and shame on us to help us wake up. We're reaping what we've sown, in other words. We're, the chastening from God is to wake us up. This does not explain all the pain on the innocents. But maybe it partly does. Sometimes other people are suffering because of stupid mistakes someone else has made. With God's spirit, that makes us feel even worse. When we know our stupidity is causing others, whether that's our family, our children, our wife, our husband, pain. David counted Israel. Apparently he shouldn't have done that. You can read about that in 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. And 70,000 people died as a shepherd of Israel. That must have just devastated David. His sin of murdering Uriah and stealing Bathsheba resulted in many dead people also, not just Uriah, including his illegitimate son from that union. God spanked David very, very hard for that. The son who died was innocent. But when that son is resurrected and grows up to be a man and understands that that week of suffering he went through as a child before he died was so that David would wake up and pray and fast and get back in harmony with God. Remember, pain is when something or a relationship is out of harmony. I've received many of these spankings, too, because he cares about me and wants to wake me up. So I thank him for the pain, and I thank him for the spankings. Thank you, Abba. But the pain you're suffering could also be because of someone else's actions, and God is working through all of that. So we look up, and we trust him in our pain, even if it was or wasn't a result of something we did. If it is a result of something we did, we got drunk and and uh, had a traffic accident or ran over somebody or or something or ruined our family, in the end, we trust him that it's going to work out. In the end, it is well with my soul. In the end, it is good. And also in the end, you can read in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 30 to 32, that if we would just be more alert and see ourselves going off the, off track, if we would judge ourselves, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 30 to 32, when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord, says in verse 32. Verse 31 says, if we would just judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. So Paul is saying, catch yourself more often going the wrong way. Stop it. Come back. Many times in my life, I've carried a white stone in my pocket. It's a beautiful white stone. And I usually put it on the um, sink, so I see it first thing when I get up, and then I put it in my pocket. It's to remind me of the white stone said to one of the churches of Revelation. I think it's in Revelation 2. 
to him who repents, I'll give him the white stone, which was a, um, it might have been Revelation 3 or 2, I, I'm not sure, but it's, it's in one of those churches where Jesus Christ is saying, if you repent, I'll give you the white stone, which was a, and when you went to court in those days in those areas, the judge would give you a black stone if you were guilty and had to be punished, and he'd give you a white stone if you were, if you were freed, if you were acquitted, if you were not guilty. And it was a symbol of being judged. And in this case, your judgment came out good. So I put a white stone in my pocket to remind me that I'm being judged and to be tougher on myself, to fight more with Christ's help and Christ's power, to submit more to him and ask him to fight for me and with me the sins and the temptations that beset us, to judge myself so I don't have to get so hard a spanking next time. I've been spanked hard. I've been spanked hard. Maybe a lot of you have too. So, that last point is, think of also the pain as a result, as, as, because it is chastening. God's chastening somebody, okay? Uh, may not answer the particular pain you're in, but there are other points, okay? And so another point is it helps us to relate to others and to comfort others. I have no idea what it's like to have MS, because I've never had MS, I know a dear friend of mine, a brother in Christ, who's had MS for a long time. He certainly can encourage people who are going through a ter- terrible duress and a long trial. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 5, I'd like you to turn there and read it, please. For 2, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God, the God of our Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Second Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 5. Verse 4 now. Who comforts us in all our troubles, in all our tribulation, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we received, which we ourselves are comforted by God. So he says very clearly there, that some of the trouble you're going through is so that you can relate. And also in the world to come, there will be many, many people from many, many backgrounds with many, many issues. And so God has to have within his body of future leaders, people who are familiar with the pain and the suffering from all kinds of physical illness and and also the results of sin. I'm not connecting the two necessarily there. I'm not. But I'm saying, for example, an alcoholic who comes into the body and overcomes that will understand others who are alcoholic, fornicators, adulterers, liars and thieves and homosexuals will understand others who have that same issue to deal with. That's just a fact. So again, to help you be more sensitive to others, The Almighty God is allowing you to go through these things. And again, we thank God for our pain, whether mental or physical, because without it, we would not be able to understand that kind of pain or that issue as we deal with other people going through something in particular. But if we have been through it ourselves, it's easier to relate. Another point then, so the last one was it helps us to relate to others, to comfort others, to empathize, okay? Another point for pain is pain makes us move and gets us in sync with what God wants. It's the old goading the prod, you know, so to speak. Uh, you know that someone mentioned the example of the invisible fence people are putting around their yards. Uh, they put a certain collar on their dog. If that dog goes too far, starts heading out of bounds, it feels a... Um, not a, I don't think it's pain so much as a vibration or something. I, I don't know much about it, but, but anyway, they don't like it and they come back away from that source of that pain or that, uh, discomfort. Pain makes you take your hand off a hot stove. Pain should tell us something is not in sync. A relationship is off. A law may be broken by someone someplace. And so pain is what gets us in harmony to move. Pain is what got Jacob to move to Egypt. Pain 
makes us move. It's that simple. And uh, and in that move, we trust we're going where Yahweh wants us to go. Do we not? Excuse me, just a second. And so pain makes us move in the direction God wants us to go to. Another point, pain drives us to our knees in prayer, much more than if you had no pain. King David, when his baby was dying, he fasted seven days. King Hezekiah prayed very fervently. King Manasseh, a very evil man, he prayed fervently. and God heard his prayers. Do you pray more in pain or do you pray more when you're not in pain? Do you pray more when everything is going well, or do you pray more when everything is going difficultly? My point is, thank God for the pain because it's driving us closer to God. Anything that drives us closer to God, to Abba, has to be a good thing. And if pain is what it takes to drive us on our knees and drive us closer to Abba, And Abba, we thank you in and for that pain. We're told in the Bible, Paul says, in two different places, we thank God for, I think, Philippians 4, verses 4, 5, 6, somewhere in there, or 7, somewhere in there, it says that that in all things, giving thanks. And then another place it says for all things. And so even for the pain. Here's a great big point. Another reason for pain Pain ultimately changes our perspective, our priorities. I'd like you to even talk about this if you're in a group there. But let me go through this fairly quickly. I have a lot more to cover still. The trying of our faith helps us see what's really important. Pain gives us depth. Depth. Um, Can't say that. Depth. (laughs) Shallow people are people who've never had pain. Shallow people just don't have serious trials, it seems. But it really helps us learn that life is not about having a big, comfy experience in this life. We have to learn that. That's not what Father is mostly all about. Father wants us to be ready for eternity. Father wants us to be leaders on the victory stand. All I know is that the people at the Olympics who get on the victory stand went through a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of sacrifice. A lot of hard working out. A lot of relationship with their coach. A lot of doing without. That others were, you know, having to get up early in the morning uh, and do those laps in the pool or whatever. So this life is not about us having a comfy experience, but learning to love and trust God in all things and to love people no matter what. We learn through pain that life is ultimately about relationships. We learn from broken relationships, how painful it is when we're not in relationship, when we're not in harmony, such as having a divorce or estrangement from your kids, your own flesh and blood or something. And we strive to restore those where possible. Pain drives us to our knees. You know what it's like when you're suffering or you're hearing that your child was in an accident. What do you do? You pray. You pray instantly. Why weren't you praying before? (laughs) You see? And so what is most important is our relationship with Abba. If pain drives us closer to that relationship, it's a good thing. We learn through pain that life is not about what we want, but about preparing for eternity. It's about what Abba wants in us for our good. Pain makes us realize our true priorities. All the pain in the world can't compare to the glory of true priority that pain is preparing us to receive. I want to read Romans 8.18. Romans 8.18. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Written by a man who was stoned and shipwrecked several times and beaten with rods many times and lashed with lashes for 39 lashes till his back was sore and bruised, persecuted, imprisoned. The sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed in us. 
And if you let it, your pain can also give you his glory as people see your faith can lead you to God's glory as they see your faith, as they experience your joy, even as you grieve. Remember, it says he's going to share that glory with us. We are co-heirs with Christ. And sometimes, you know, the pain we're going through is for God's glory. Remember the story of Lazarus? And Jesus heard he was sick, and he said last in John 11, verse 4, John 11, verse 4, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So pray that in your pain, God can be glorified. I will say this, that I, I remember a lady in, the, uh, in, in, in Canada uh, who had MS really, really bad, and, and, and she kept coming to church for as long as she could. I mean, they had to bring her in a, in a bed. You could barely talk and everything. Finally, she died, and yet her example and her faith and her testimony and her peace was such an example to the rest of us and enlightened all of us to, we probably would have been complaining, we figured, and we would, what I'm saying is her pain brought glory to God. Pain also humbles us. Remember Paul, the thorn in his flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure? 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 and 8. Lest I should be exalted above measure. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 and 8. I was given a thorn in the flesh. He pleaded with God three times to take it away, and God said no. God said no. So pain also humbles us and teaches us perseverance and patience, according to James. That's another reason for pain. Another reason for pain. I'm just moving through quickly here because I've got several more pages. I'm almost out of time. Pain teaches us to focus on the end and not the present. I want you to turn to this one, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Pain teaches us to focus on the end. It's kind of like the same point about changes our priorities and what we're focusing on. God wants us focusing on the end result, not, not the present. Let's read a few verses here. And as you're going through pain, I hope you'll take out the notes from this sermon or, or print out the transcript and read them again and remind yourselves of these things. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, remember this is after Hebrews 11 and the stories of all those men and women of faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and run with patience and endurance the race that's set before us. Now look at Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, was set ahead of him, what it means there, the joy that was ahead of him, before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We can do the same. We can look ahead and look for what's set ahead of us. Paul did that so many times. So did Peter and James. They always talked about the glory that's about to come. Focus on the end result. Focus on the better resurrection. Focus on on, on what lies ahead of you a co-heir with Christ, a son of God, with heavenly Jerusalem as your city, as your home. Focus on all of that. And like Paul had said, we read earlier, that the, not, none of the sufferings of the present age is worthy to be compared with the glory that's about to be revealed in us. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter 5. And he talks about that you greatly rejoice in all these various trials you have. First Peter 1, verses 4 to 9. I won't take the time to read it, but just you can read it later. First Peter 1, verses 4 to 9. And in the end of it, verse 9, he says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And before that, he talked about the testing and the trying of our faith uh, getting us there. And then First Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. May the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. My point is, look ahead of you and realize the pain is to help us get ready for that. Pain is to help us be stronger. Another point now. Pain is to help us be stronger, but not in our faith, not in our strength, but in Christ's strength, we must get this. Second Corinthians 12, verses 9 
and 10. We must get this. It's not so much that we're getting stronger, but that we're learning to use the strength that's available to us. We're learning to let him live in us. We're going to his strength. Stand in the strength of the Lord, it says in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the strength of the Lord. So sometimes it takes a long time to learn this, that pain drives us to our knees, and not that we are going to buck up and do it ourselves, but we learn to submit all of that to him and let him handle it. That's why we're told to cast all our cares upon him. That's why we're told that I can do all things through Christ. Our strength comes not in our fighting. Our strength comes in our surrendering. Our strength comes in our submission to Almighty God. Our strength comes in our surrender to Jesus Christ. Okay, Second Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. He said to you, my, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I think that was in context of the thorn in the flesh. Yes, it is. It's in context of the thorn in the flesh. We'd read the first part earlier where Paul had asked for the thorn to be taken away three times. And the answer he got, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, my grace, my grace, God's grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. When people see that you're still able to do that after having been whipped and beaten and lashed and stoned and shipwrecked, they know he can't be doing that on human strength. That's got to be my strength. That's why I've said and taught for many years that I believe Samson was not a, a man who looked like uh, the weightlifters of today. I think he looked like an ordinary man. So that was evident and, and obvious. It wasn't his own strength. Something miraculous and, and uh, supernatural was coming upon him. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Second Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Therefore I most gladly boast in my infirmities. Oh, Father, help us get there. That the power of Christ may rest upon me Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, and in needs, and persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am strong, for when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, in other words, when I'm weak, I go to him, and he strengthens me. That's what he's saying. Wow, brethren. It's when we realize we're in pain and need help that we turn to him. And because of the pain, we experience the joy of his salvation. Because of the pain, we experience his strength. Because of the pain, we get to see wonders happening. Because of the pain, we see miracles begin to happen. Because of the pain, we see open doors beginning to happen. Hallelujah! But that strength and the power and the open doors aren't because we're so good or we're so strong, but because we've said, not my will, but yours be done. We are being trained to be crack team of leaders, but the strength and power will be in him. We are a crack team because it's only because we've learned to surrender all and trust him 100%. We're only going to be leaders because we've learned to say with Christ, not my will, my dear Abba, who loves me, but thy will be done. And whatever you make me go through, whatever happens in my trials, Lord, it's all good. It's all well. It is well with my soul, for I am with you. And even if you make me walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm walking with you. Your rod, your staff is comforting me. And I'm strong in you. That's where we have to end up. Father is concerned about our well-being, yes, but that's not often, but it's often not the same way we think it should be. He is more concerned with eternity. He wants hearts that trust him to transform into his way of thinking. The crucible of pain is what refines out the sludge, leaves the pure gold. Even when we see nothing good coming from the severe trial we're in. Nothing good, at least not yet. We come to trust him that he's working something good out of it. We come to trust him. That's the bottom line, brethren. That's the bottom line. Nothing in God's word promises us we'll like everything in this life. Nothing. But there's nothing in his word that says we'll understand everything he's doing to us. But everything in his word says, trust me, have peace in me, believe in me, look to me, 
regardless of what's going on around you, and I'll give you perfect peace. Paul came to that. Isaiah came to that. Job came to that. David came to that. You and I must come to that. He's the living God. We are not. He's the potter. We are the clay. And what he's sending, what he's allowing, is all for a reason. We don't need to understand fully why. We just need to understand fully who. He is involved. He will make it good for eternity. He will explain someday how it all fits together for good to them who love him. Pain leads us to that. Without pain, there's no glory. Without pain, there'd be no kingdom for us. Without pain, there'd there'd be no growth. Without pain, we wouldn't come and see and know Abba so deeply. So thank the living God for pain. I mean every word of that. And rest in the peace that he is guiding you and opening doors and shutting doors because he is love. Pain drives us to Abba. And in the end, that's always a good thing. In Acts 16, verses 22 to 26, here's a story in Philippi. Acts 16, verses 22 to 26. Paul and Silas had just been arrested, beaten with rods. And when they laid many stripes on them, Acts 16, 23, they threw them into prison. And they put them in the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks, couldn't even move. They're in pain. They're bleeding. Maybe broken bones, broken nose. Who knows? At midnight, what would you be doing at midnight? We'd probably be wondering, where are you, Father? I thought you were going to protect me. That wasn't Paul and Silas. No, no. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. There was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. You know the rest of the story. The jailer was converted. God used that as a testimony that my people, beaten and bloodied, still trust, still trust, still pray, still praise. Father wants you and me to get it and to get to that point too. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 11, it's all about eventually, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 11, that the power of God is seen in us, that the life of Jesus Christ, verse 11, is manifested in us, that they don't see the flesh they see. With The more they see how you are handling pain and the way you are handling suffering and distress and trials and problem after problem of life, that they're watching Yeshua live in you, People want to know who Yeshua was and what he's like. All they should have to do is watch a child of God who is close to God. And that's what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 11. We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 now. We're perplexed, not in despair, though. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, we're perplexed, he says. There are times we wonder, but not in despair. See, that's verse verse 8. And now verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. The life that he is living again inside of us. We are in him and he is in us. For we we who live are always delivered to the death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus, verse 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 11, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Then he goes on in verse 16. It's all about trusting God. It's all about trusting God, no matter what. That's why there is so much pain. Even if your baby dies. I've been there. Even if you have car accidents. Even if you lose your job. Even if you have persecution. Even if you have pain from arthritic, rheumatoid arthritis or whatever. It's all about having peace in our heart. Worry and faith do not cohabit. Grief and faith can, but not worry and faith. When we fret, that's not faith. When we know Abba is aware of all things, we can be like Christ asleep in the back of the boat and during a storm while everyone fretted. Oh, you have little faith. 
Why do you worry? He says, wind, go away. <laughs> Remember Isaiah, you will keep him in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts on you. That's where Father wants us to go. Lucifer, Halel, rebelled. So from now on, anybody added to the family of God will have to be people he can absolutely trust. No matter how much pain they go through, no matter how much things aren't going the way they thought, they will always look to me. Am I there yet? No. I sure wish I was, though. All I know is there'd probably be less pain the closer to that I get, although Paul sure went through a lot. But look where he ended up with all this faith. And then 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. After everything Paul went through, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18, for our light affliction, wow, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, all that affliction is working something great. While we do not look at the things which, which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for all the things which are seen are temporary, but the things not seen, that's what's eternal, he says. That's Second Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. So that's why we go through pain, to drive us closer to God, to make us have faith that no matter what, it's all good, no matter what's going on. We must learn it's all good when I'm looking up, when I refuse to worry and fret. I can grieve, but I grieve in hope. I can wonder, but I must not lose heart. I can cry out to him, for I know he loves me and I trust him, even in the severe pain, even if it leads to death, even if it leads to martyrdom. It's all for a witness, for his glory. It's all for his will. And so it's all good. It's all good, isn't it? Will there be a time of no pain? Yes, brethren. Revelation 21, verses 2 to 5, when the new Jerusalem comes down, verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. No more pain. That time is coming. And in the end, it's all good. It's all well with my soul, largely because of pain. And I hope this has helped you and been a blessing to you. If you know people in pain, if you think this will bless them, let them know about this message. And thank you very much. And God bless you. May he walk with you and be with you and give you peace in all the pain you're going through. And may you grow in all that pain to trust him and love him. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.